We're gonna kickstart the afternoon with a session on inclusive innovation with Heather Campbell, Executive Director of Clean Technology with Alberta Innovates. Heather has a diverse 25 year energy career that spans technical, policy and business roles in a full range of industries. She's an engaged, a lifelong community volunteer who actively shares her talent, resources at and time and she's going to do just that with us today. She's going to speak to us about inclusive innovation, how competitiveness in clean technology depends on it, what a just transition really means, why authentic inclusion and equity in innovation is important, and so much more. Please join me in welcoming Heather Campbell. Okay, thanks Isabella. Um, this is quite lovely. So I have the, you know, wonderful spot right after lunch, right when that cake, that nice piece of Earl Grey cake, you had some of that, right? That's when that's going to start to hit you. And um, I'm going to actually not do like happy moments up here. Um, I do have a bit of energy. It's just kind of my nature. But this is kind of the tough love portion of the, com of the, of the day. So I'm going to tell you how to, it's basically, it's, it's called inclusive innovation. But honestly, this should really be titled, How Not to Get a Zero on Your Application from Me, Brian, or Brett. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, as Isabella said, I am Heather Campbell. Um, I am Executive Director of Clean Technology uh, with Alberta Innovates. Uh, the clean technology team, which is within uh, clean resources, handles CCUS, hydrogen, uh, bioenergy and circular economy, renewable alternative energy, and critical minerals and emerging technology. So all the things. Um, in my work with Alberta Innovates, I am honored to come to you uh, from Calgary, Mokinstis, where I live as a guest on the traditional lands, indigenous lands of Treaty 7 and Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. So clean technology addresses sustainability while creating opportunity for economic diversification in Alberta. We need to consider more than just achieving net zero. We actually need to establish a mindset and the tools to stay there. The conversation on net zero right now is focused mostly on the actual tools and the technologies. It also needs to focus on the behaviors and the values. Practically, when we speak about it's really just speaking about reducing emissions and achieving environmental performance when we talk about clean technology. That's it. As Alberta's innovation engine, we believe that innovation is key to growing the economy, expanding markets, and creating new and better opportunities for Albertans. Now, that's all Albertans, not just some. So I talked a little bit about on the just like literally just like one slide ago. So if you were listening or you weren't going into that food coma, you would have heard me say clean technology addresses sustainability while creating opportunity for economic diversification in Alberta. The biggest opportunity in clean technology, however, is the need to deliver a just energy transition. Canada has implemented programs to increase, increase clean technology um, and clean energy opportunities for underrepresented groups, including women, youth, and Indigenous peoples. You heard Derek talk about that just before lunch. Beyond government programs, several not-for-profit groups, industry collaborations have put in place innovative programs designed to ensure that clean energy workforce is more inclusive than the traditional energy sector has been. So to deliver a just energy transition, it's actually going to require Albertans to make an attitudinal shift. So some have mistaken the notion that, first of all, clean technology will replace the oil and gas industry, which is not true. Let me repeat that because I know this is being recorded. Clean technology will not replace the oil and gas industry. Camera one, okay, camera two, okay. All right. The second one is this other barrier, and it's uh, this other piece of thinking where somehow Alberta is not a player in clean technology, and that one's really untrue. So again, camera one, it is untrue that Alberta is not a player in clean technology. All right. 
So clean technology itself, on the upswing, that was the title of this event. Uh, it's part of our entrepreneurial ecosystem, and it's the fastest growing area of, for large energy players. That's why you have folks like Evoke. And who were their LPs? Arc Resources, Suncor, Synovus. Not small players. But Alberta's now about energy in many forms. Alberta's energy offering is pluralistic. So should the entities that deliver that energy offering be. So what is a just transition? Well, it's not about speed. It doesn't just mean, okay, get her done. It's also not about eliminating options. It doesn't mean just get off oil and gas. It's actually about inclusion, my friends. See, I told you, this is that tough love section. So in this city, in Calgary, every single board table I've seen, and trust me, I've seen a lot of them, is big enough to accommodate diverse voices. No one is actually left behind in a just energy transition. Alberta can actively and critically deploy the same skill sets in a just energy transition that they used in the traditional energy sector. Consider the clean technology work of Ever Technologies. Ever Technologies is a closed loop geothermal demonstration project, which Alberta Innovates was the first to fund. Um, this geothermal power generation demonstration project highlights the skills of our drilling industry and unlocked new export opportunities for this particular um, technology for Europe and the rest of Canada. Ever Technologies use precision drilling. Founded in Calgary in 1951 to drill their geothermal wells. No one is left behind in a just energy transition. Now, ensuring that Canada's, Alberta's, and Calgary's energy transformation is authentically inclusive and is prioritized is challenging to achieve. Having incremental women in STEM fields, and especially engineering, in my view, um, will facilitate women participating in and purposely leading the energy transformation. Women are drawn to clean technology in high percentage, relatively speaking. My entire team, with the exception of one, are all women. I didn't design it that way, it just happened, but I'll take it every time. Um, but we're still significantly underrepresented in clean technology overall. In Canada, gender equality in the economy could bring another 150 billion in GDP to the country. That's the prize that's being left on the table. To put that into context for all of you, the previous, I think two previous budgets ago um, for Alberta, that budget was only 50 billion. So let's talk about income gaps and ways to have women participate in and lead Alberta's energy transition. Let's talk about my friends, Apega. So every year, as a licensed professional engineer, I receive information that tells me how much less I'm compensated as a woman. How many engineers in this room? How many women engineers? You all get that salary survey too, yeah? Okay, perfect. So all the, 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 one, the first ones, did you actually realize that, that when you re read that salary survey, that it told you that every year? Nod your head, shake your head, no? Okay, go back, read it again. It's available online. So every year for 26 years running, I've received that information. How much for you? 17 years. Now, you see, the thing is, I'm a black woman, so I'm not about like just like pay equity. I'm actually about reparations. So I would like all of my money from the start. Can you imagine what that would look like? <laughs> no, I'm actually quite serious. Can you imagine if I actually went back and said, okay, tell you what all. <laughs> I would like all of my income wage gap compared to my male peers since 1996. 
and every other woman engineer in this room did that? Okay, this is what we're talking about. Last year, 2021, was the first year that APEGA data actually showed that industry had closed the wage gap for engineers in training. So up to last year, from day one, the day they actually sign on to an employment contract, women engineers in this province were compensated 2.4% less. I don't know what they did from graduating from university, getting their ring, getting the degree, moving up to Fort Mac and starting a job and moving out of their parents' basement, but apparently that was worth 2.4% less. In this room, we're leaders. We can actually make a change to that. Now, what's missing from that data, of course, are the intersectional realities. I live those intersectional realities as a black woman and as a professional engineer. So intersectionality, not a kooky academic theory as once espoused by a former Alberta premier, factors into my daily living and my compensation. I know it, I feel it, but I have no quantitative data that demonstrates it because we don't collect race-based data in engineering or in anything in Canada. In one of their blogs last year, the Center for Innovation Studies stated that the rate of women's entrepreneurship in Alberta is almost 90% of the men's rate. Apparently, that's one of the highest ratios in the world. The Canadian average was only 66%. In Alberta, 30% of women are involved in startups, compared with 13% on average elsewhere in the country. We're doing cool things here. Notwithstanding that, Women-owned businesses currently receive just 2.8% of venture capital funding available worldwide and an estimated 4% of VC funding in Canada. Women are also underrepresented among equity investors, representing only 15.2% of Canadian VC partners and 16.7% of Canadian angel investors. So I know this morning Carl talked about, um, from NRCI rap mentioned gray hair or no hair and well, I can sort of say this because I sit on IRAP's advisory board. Is that the right mix of advisors to meet the needs of our clean technology ecosystem? I'm not sure. We're thinking about that. So in my life, grid modernization, one of those cool clean technology concepts, two-way flow on wires, all that kind of fun stuff, um, used to just be about cost, reliability, and performance. Now it has to be about cost, reliability, performance, sustainability, energy equity, energy access, energy affordability, and energy independence. Energy storage is an excellent example of what a practical, just energy transition looks like. I drive a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. It's actually plugged in outside, in the parking lot, in the cold. I should be able to use it as an energy storage tool at my home. That gives me decision-making choice in my energy consumption. I become an empowered energy citizen, new terminology, through clean technology. Let that sit with you. We need to put an inclusive lens on the development and the deployment of clean technology. Many of the solutions that are required for the energy transformation are engineering solutions. It's how the world works. Energy storage is a great example of transformative technology that can deliver elements of a just energy transition. Energy storage is needed to enable the integration of renewables for power onto the grid. We all know that. But energy storage is also an opportunity and the corresponding technology development around it to enable energy independence, energy access, energy affordability, and energy equity, particularly for indigenous and remote communities. That's the kind of just tr energy transition I'm passionate about, and I think, you know, quite frankly, I'm kind of called to deliver. So, this is a particular healthcare example, but it's relevant to all of us when we consider the mechanism by which this exclusive approach to technology development continues to manifest. So, 
everybody knows what a pulse oximeter is coming out of the pandemic? Yeah, it's the thing they put on your finger and it actually measures your blood oxygen content. So if you're not, if you don't have enough oxygen, they give you, they put you on a ventilator. We all know this COVID. Okay, thanks. Anyway, okay. So the quote in this particular article, and you can actually find this on Reuters, um, that's personally crushing to me is this one. It's been known since the 1970s that skin pigmentation can throw off readings, but the discrepancies were not believed to affect patient care. So medically we've known for 50 years that pulse oximeters as currently designed and we currently use as a diagnostic tool to report, report poorly on black patients, but no one seemed to care or find another tool by which to assess blood oxygen content in black patients. Ouch. <laughs> so I mentioned earlier, I'm an engineer, fairly proud one, but when I speak to young engineers, first thing I tell them is learn how to write. Yes, I know, that's also how you don't get a zero. <laughs> Particularly from, I'm gonna say, Dr. Brett Purdy and Mr. Brian Helfenbaum. Please be able to explain your technology. That's what we're gonna tell you when, you when we go into the corner. So learn how to write. Okay, but then after, after that, I also tell them to ask critical questions about their work. Who, by the nature of your work, will potentially be marginalized? Who will be excluded? How are you authentically advancing equality through your design and engineering work? It's the same thing with the innovation and the work that we do here. I think, and this is just Heather Campbell thinks, uh, for a clean technology project in which investment is made with public funds, we should be able to ask the project developers and proponents, how would this successfully be deployed in an indigenous community using indigenous ways of knowing and doing? So, now what? How do you answer the application questions and get the money? Okay, we're gonna take you through that. <laughs> so, there are a bunch of words on this slide, um, and they're in small font, and I apologize for that, but, you know, get out the box of Costco reading glasses and, 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 and dig in. Um, we're gonna spend some time here so you can kinda go deep. At Alberta Innovates, we ask three questions in our continuous intake application on impact. We ask a bunch more questions, but these are the three that we ask on, ask on impact. And those are on economic impact, environmental impact, and social impact. We're not the only ones who ask these questions. Remember, Mark told you we talk to each other. So we know that everybody else asks these questions too. Our application processes are all kind of similar so this is how not to fail this question. Let's help you perform better because we're all about success. We wanna give you the money, we really do. So, economics. Let's talk about that one. So say for example, you were actively working in partnership with an indigenous community to deliver equity and prosperity into an indigenous community. Are you creating jobs in an untapped workforce? Let's recall that the fastest growing segment of our population are young indigenous people. Please do not write, well, you know, we funded uh, an ice rink in, insert indigenous community here, and that was our indigenous engagement. No, don't do that. That will get you a zero from me, for sure. Okay, environmental. So will your technology make a step change in environmental performance for Alberta and potentially a developing country? Are you solving the challenge of safe, clean drinking water in an indigenous community? If you mess up the land with your technology because you're not thinking about land and you're thinking about your emissions reductions over here for me, you will get a zero from Dr. Brett Purdy. That's literally just how it works. Social. 
is your technology accessible to all Albertans? Does it improve the lives of those in marginalized communities? What is the makeup of your project team? So, if you list the one black person on your team as the junior, and then you don't even put their last name down, and their first name is Jennifer, and I can look them up and can't find them because they don't exist because it's a picture you picked from like Shutterstock, you will get a zero from me, no doubt. Remember, Mark told you we talk, don't make stuff up. <laughs> we will find out and we will not give you the money because that's not nice. Alberta's only four to five million people. We know most of them. So at the end of the day, clean technology addresses sustainability while creating opportunity for economic diversification in Alberta. We do that well when we do it inclusively. Thank you. <laughs>